Thank you very much. God bless you. May be seated in the heavenly places. Hallelujah. Thank you very much for the warm welcome and greatly honored to be here tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. I brought with me Richard, Richard uh, Takapautolo from Tonga. So he gets up, if you can just give Richard a hand. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> You've had two Indians this morning, and now we've got two islanders tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Every one of us is in a journey. And uh, the Church Unlimited is in a journey. Individually, you are in a journey. And uh, it's a great thing to live for God. Yeah. Now that's uh, what you speak in heaven, and um, <laughs> when you get to heaven, you're all going to have to learn how to speak Samoan, <laughs> and uh, you might as well do it while you're here. It's part of the preparation for entering glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. But everyone is on a journey, and uh, everyone has a destiny. There are certain things that about life that... Uh, that we grapple with and that we talk about in churches, uh, leadership, the power of God, the anointing of the Spirit, the unlimitedness of God, and all these things we, we share and talk about because they are part of the truth of what we live for and the part of the truth that God is. And I congratulate your pastors, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Barna, for this fantastic work and uh, thank you very much for affording me the privilege of uh, just sharing with you tonight. But a journey is not a trip. I just returned from Samoa, arrived on Thursday night and spoke at a conference at uh, Pastor Graham uh, Grace International Conference, uh, Kingdom Expansion. And I took a trip to Samoa because we had a family funeral. And, and when you take a trip, you just want to get there. You don't care what happens. You just get, just get me there. And, and the destination of the trip is what you're looking for. You just want to arrive. But on a journey, every part of the journey is important and the journey is as important as the destination. In fact, the whole journey plus its destination is your destiny. When Moses encountered God in the, in the burning bush, went to Egypt, had the communion, God dealt with the firstborn in Egypt, he came out with the people. He came to the Red Sea. Then he crossed the Red Sea and came to the waters of Marah. And, and every part of that journey has a lesson for the man and the woman of God. Not just Moses, even though Moses was the one. We are still learning from that journey. And as we journey in life, every part of the journey has a significance and has to do with our destiny in God. Hallelujah. So I just want to talk a little bit tonight on your, our destiny. We've got a church called Destiny. And, but these are subjects that people talk about. And I only have tonight, so I'll just talk to you about it. And after that, we can go home. Hallelujah. But your destiny is never found in a safe place. If you're looking for safety, forget it. Your destiny in God is never found in a safe place. It's found in a place of vulnerability. When you're vulnerable before God, when you expose your heart to God, when you come and give your life to the Lord and your journey begins... 
most of the time, if you're a Samoan, it's a vulnerable place because when you give your heart to the Lord, your family may say, what are you doing? Hallelujah. So here you've got Moses, a great destiny in God, and you can imagine that the Pharaoh said, if it's a boy, we'll kill him. If it's a girl, we'll let her live. So Amram and Jehoshaphat will be praying with Aaron and Miriam, holding hands, agreeing before God. They know if it's a boy, it's going to die. So they agree for a girl. Hello? But when it was born, it was a boy. And they thought, it's going to die. That's the, the edict of the Pharaoh, that if it's a boy, we're going to kill him. And Moses has a destiny, and in his destiny, the whole nation has a destiny. And as a whole nation, your destiny, hello? But now, born in a time when no man should be born. Born in a ghetto, but raised in a palace. Are you all right? Maybe you're born in the hospital, but uh, Jesus had a great destiny for the future of the plan of his father for the universe. Born in a manger. So our destiny in God is never found in a place where you feel okay. It's always found in a place that is vulnerable, it's unsafe from our perspective. It's not safe. And if you're looking for a safe place, you think doing a unlimited a church, unlimited a New Zealand and beyond is safe? It's vulnerable. You don't know if people are coming. You don't know if the budget is going to be met. It's vulnerable. You have to walk into it by faith. Otherwise, the fear alone will suffocate you. That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. That's why faith transacts everything in the kingdom. It's not the millions. It's not the thousands. It's faith. Hallelujah. Joseph, raised in his father's house, had a coat of many colors, had the favor of his dad, <laughs> told his brothers his vision, and got uh, blessed for it. <laughs> you, have to, you have to read my Samoan sense of humor, okay? Otherwise, you'll miss half the sermon. <laughs> He told his brothers, when God tells you something, don't tell anybody. They might kill you. So he went from being in father's favor, ripped off the covering of his father's favor, sold as a slave, found himself in a pit, went from the pit to a prison, went from the prison to the palace. Most Samoans went to start with the palace. But from the pit, it's terrible, got promoted to Potiphar's house, become a slave of Potiphar, then got promoted to prison. Hello? It's vulnerable. And yet, his destiny was powerful. And every part of the journey had a significance in what God wanted him to do. How did he know that how did he know that if you have seven years of plenty, you pile up for the seven years of famine? Where did he learn that? In prison? How did he do that? Because when you're in a cell and you got nothing to do, you observe the walls and the only things in the walls are ants. 
And in the, in the summer months, the ants are going, laborious little insects. In the winter months, where are the ants? Hello? Joseph considered the ant in the prison because every part of the journey. And Pharaoh said, who else can do that but you? Where did he learn that? The wisdom of the ant. You say, that's not in the Bible. Well, I just put it in there. <laughs> Hallelujah. You got David out there. When Samuel came and said to Jesse, I'm looking for a king. And Eliab turned up and said, whoa, what a good looking Samuel. No wonder God rejected Saul. This is the one. And when he got up to anoint him, God said, ah, 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 on a minute, wrong, wrong, wrong. And then seven other, seven boys paraded before Samuel. And, and God never said anything. Now, I'm glad Samuel was not a Kiwi. You know why? Because he would have anointed the wrong guy. Hallelujah. Say amen. amen. And then Samuel said to Jesse, Jesse, are these all the boys? And Jesse said, no. There's one out there looking after the sheep. The only one in the family that has red head. Where did he get his red head from? Maybe Jesse. And so Jesse sent him to look after the sheep, hoping that a bear or a lion will kill him so that the family can close that part of the closet. He said, that's not, I, I just put it in there, okay? <laughs> and he said, we will not sit down hither. We will not sit down to eat until he come hither. And then they send the runner to get him. And when the runner arrived, Jesse was worshiping God. The only audience that heard his song was God, the trees, and the sheep. And when he came, this ruddy, red-headed little Indian boy. I went to India. Chennai spoke at uh, Dr. Mowen's church, and, and one of his pastors' name was Sam. He's Indian. That's logical, isn't it? And Sam was dating a girl named Shannon, and Shannon was an American missionary. And I said to them, just imagine, your children are going to be American Indians. <laughs> <laughs> So here comes this ruddy, red-headed little Indian. And God said to the old prophet, Arise, get your horn out. That's the king of Israel. And the old man began to quake. And he got up, took the horn of oil, and poured it on him. And when he poured it on him, David probably thought, They do this to kings and prophets. I wonder what he's doing. And after he poured it on him, he got up and he said, Thou art worthy, and go back to the sheep. Hello? It's never safe when God has a destiny for your life, but be absolutely sure wherever you go, the presence of God will go with you. It becomes such a thing that you will not be able to leave it alone. And when Moses said, If you're not going... Don't send me. I don't want the angels. I don't want the elders. I don't want the leadership. I want you. Hallelujah. Are you all right? Hallelujah. So don't look for a safe place. But look with the eyes of faith. 
Hallelujah. Secondly, now I don't normally preach in points. I just preach. But I pass uh, Europeans and Asians. And Asians and Europeans like points. Point one. Point two. If you read the Bible, Jesus said, okay, uh, there comes verse number one. No. When Jesus preaches, point one, point 53, point 67. Hello? Hello? Are you all right? But it's nice to set things in order so that you find a place to hang your hat. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. You're very quiet. Are you always quiet? <laughs> Your destiny is always found in the hand of another man. It's found in the hand of another woman. That's why you're married to the one you're married to. That's part of your destiny because the product of your marriage, the, un the unity of your prayers will avail much. Why? Because God will put your destiny in the hand of another man. So you have to discern the hand God gives to you. God has put your destiny in the hand of this man. If you don't like Indians, you may say no. And you will miss your destiny because you need discernment to realize what God is going to give to you. And God may give you a hand that you think is leprous, and yet in the hand of that lepra is your destiny. So you need to learn to discern when God gives you a hand. Hallelujah. Naomi said, are you going to wait until I have another two boys before and, and if, if I have another two boys in my, in my womb, are you going to wait until they grow up so you, you can marry them? Go back. And Opa said, okay, I'll go back. Ruth said, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your God will be my God. Your people shall be my people. Where you die, I shall die. Because she knew. Ruth, Naomi, never even imagined that God was waiting for them in Bethlehem, Judah. Here is a, a little girl. They're both widows. Naomi and Elimelech went to Moab to save life. The very thing they wanted to save, they lost. That three deaths in a family of four. Sometimes, if you're not careful... You're going to go to Moab looking for life and you're going to end up burying the very lives that you want to save. So here they come back. None of them had a husband. They, hadn't, they haven't got a, a home. They haven't got a bank account. All they have was each other. They did not know. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, New Judah, all the women came and said, oh, it's Naomi's turn up. They said, don't call me Naomi. Call me bitter. I'm bitter. He said, I went out full, I came back empty. Empty? What about the girl? You know the rest of the story. Ruth married Boaz. Ruth gave birth to Obed. Obed gave birth to Jesse. Jesse gave birth to David. David gave birth to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Your destiny... God will put your destiny, your future, your ministry in the hand of another man, in the hand of another woman. Here comes Elijah. No genealogy. Every time a prophet is introduced, here is a, a Jeremiah, the, the son of Hilkiah, or the son of somebody else. But they, they introduce this guy and he said, Elijah the Tishbite. 
who was one of the inhabitants of Judah, came to Ahab and said this, it will not rain for three and a half years until I say the word. From now on, I control the weather. That's power. So God said, well, go to the book Cherith and stay there, and I've, I've commanded ravens to feed you. We want a destiny where you stay in a hotel and somebody can turn up with a nice meal. Hopefully it's a hamburger or a steak or raw fish if you're Samoan. And fire fish. But here, he's, he's hiding away in a brook. And ravens, unclean birds, come to bring his food. Sometimes you think somebody's unclean, but their very lives will give you food. So he ate and bread and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the evening, drank of the brook until the brook dried up. And then God said, go to Sarepta, which belongs to Sidon. I've commanded a woman there to feed you. Fed by ravens. Fed by a woman. Later on, fed by angels. The trouble is, if you're Samoan, you want to be fed by angels, fed by angels, and fed by angels. I'm giving the Samoans a hard time, but they understand our humor. All right? But you are fed by ravens, fed by a widow, a woman with nothing, and then fed by the angelic. What happened to Elijah? Turn up to this woman's house and ask the woman for water. You realize it hadn't rained for some years. So water is the most costliest commodity, but obviously God must have spoken to her. So she kept some water for this man, and he said, get me a drink. And she went to get a drink. Before she even got the drink, he said, and get me a bread, get me a cake. Can you bake me a cake? <laughs> and sometimes we get angry at pastors in churches because they take one offering, and just after we take that offering, we take another offering. That's what she did. Get me an offering, and while they're getting that offering, they're getting me another offering. Get me some water, and while they're getting the water, get me some cake. And she cried and said, there's very little oil in the cruise, very little flour. Little oil in the jar, very little flour. I've got two sticks. We're going to bake the last meal. We're going to eat and then die. And Elijah said, go and die. Read the Bible. He says, go and do likewise. That's what the Bible says, which means go and die. But before you die, feed me first. Feed me before you die. For thus says the Lord, the flour will not run out, the oil will not run out until the day it rains. What's the story? God put the destiny of the prophet in the hand of the widow. And God put the destiny of the widow in the hand of the, of the prophet. The greatest prophet that ever lived. <laughs> he didn't write a book like Isaiah and Joel. He's not even a minor prophet like Hosea and Joel. But when God chose a prophet to turn up on the mountain of transfiguration to represent all the prophets... He chose Moses to represent the law. And this man that is a, a bookless man, hello, never wrote a book, to represent all the prophets, the three apostles to represent the church. Moses came from the dead. Elijah came from heaven. The apostles were on earth. And God said, this is my son. You listen to him. The prophets listen to him. The law listens to him. And the church listens to him. The destiny of the prophets is in him. The destiny of the law is in him. And the destiny of the church is in his hand. You listen to him. Amen. 
You know the story of Elijah? He wanted to die. And he's still not dead. <laughs> he wanted to die. Fed by angels. Get up and eat. It's a long journey. Hello? <laughs> Hello? He wanted to die and he's still not dead. Kill me. He's still not dead. He's going to come back to die. <laughs> Hello? He's going to die one day. Why? The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. He's still a man. He's not dead. Therefore, he has to die. Hallelujah. Destiny. Destiny. And God will put your destiny in the hand of another man. You may not like that hand. If it's a Samoan hand, you better like Samoans. <laughs> Why? As we said, God will often put your destiny in the hand of another man. Here is Jesus being born. And here is a boy, a young man who is blamed for a pregnant girl that they had not been married to. They weren't married. And yet God entrusted the destiny of his son into the hands of Joseph. Can God trust you with a pregnant girl out of wedlock? Are you always this quiet? You make me nervous. <laughs> Here is uh, Peter and John going to the hour of prayer, and here is a, a little guy being crippled all his life. He said, alms. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Give me your hand. He lifted him up and went to church at Church Unlimited. Hallelujah. Your destiny is found in the hands of another man. Hallelujah. Esther, the destiny of Esther, little girl, raised up by her uncle, adopted. The whole nation is going to be slaughtered. And Esther, wanting to be safe. And Mordecai said, honey, God will still deliver, but our family will not be part of the deliverance. Who knows? You come to the kingdom at such a time as this. Why don't you go? And you look at the Bible and and you'll find the destiny of kings in the hands of paupers. And you'll find the destiny of great men in the hand of crooked men. Jacob turned up, said to Laban, I'll serve you seven years for your daughter, Rachel. And seven years, after seven years of hard labor, he got paid. Wrong girl. Let me say this. God will never give you Rachel first. If you're looking for Rachel, you will always get Leah first. <laughs> I asked for Rachel. Yeah, but this is how we do it here. You get the firstborn first. You get Leah first. The problem is you can't find Rachel here at Church Unlimited, so you go to Destiny. And when you get there, you can't find Rachel there, so you go to, a, to, a, to Martin and, and Rosalie's 
Lid's church and, and I, you can't find him there, so you, you, you go to Peter Mortlock's church. What's wrong? You're looking for Rachel. Where do you find Rachel? The same place you find Leah. You just need to serve another seven years. So the, the destiny of Jacob was in the hand of a crooked uncle. And sometimes God may do that, but God gives you beauty for your ashes, joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, because God is a very economical God, and every pain or every triumph in the journey is part of the destiny that God has given to you, because God's going to use everything in your steps to minister to others the manifold grace of God. If you, if you ever read Psalms, you're going to find David. He's amazing. He's a realist. He's a real guy. Break the teeth of the wicked, oh God. Don't answer their prayer. And then they time, oh, glory to God. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Why? He's a real guy. And you, you, can, read a, a, you can read a bad Psalm on a good day. And you're going to say, this guy is so inconsistent until it's your bad day. And then you read that psalm and say, this is a godly man. <laughs> Hallelujah. Say amen. amen. Bless the Lord. Moses uh, was leading the people out into the wilderness and he wanted the help of a man who was old and was tired. His name was Jethro, his father-in-law. And he said to Jethro, uh, come with us. We don't know the wilderness like you do because you were brought up in the wilderness. We don't know where the snake pits are, but you do. He said, you can be our eyes. And Jethro said, I'm old. I better go home and rest. And so Jethro went to his house, and Israel went into the wilderness with no eyes. And it took them 40 years when it should have taken them 11 days. I wish Jethro had stayed. I wish he was younger. But sometimes... We may miss the thing God wants to do because the hand that you want to reach out, you don't know, or the hand that you want to reach out to wants to go. Are you all right? Hallelujah. Someone said no. <laughs> I spoke at a conference in Melbourne, and... Uh, I said, are you all right? And everybody said, yeah. And then uh, at the end of the conference, a uh, young pastor got up to bless the food. And he said, before I bless the food, the conference is finished. And he said, we, every time he says, are you all right? We said, yes. He said, no, I'm not all right. <laughs> the word of God just devastated my heart. And I know it did your heart. How can he say you're all right when it's not all right? <laughs> you know, when you come to church, Everything's hunky-dory until the word is preached. And then all of a sudden, hello? And it doesn't matter how many people come and preach. You want to get up to the altar, hello? Because you know it's not all right. Are you all right? <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your destiny is not found in a safe place. Your destiny is found in the hand of another man. And your destiny is found alone. You say, Pastor, you just confused me now. You said my destiny is found in the hand of somebody else that God will give somebody to journey with. Yes. But ultimately, your destiny is found alone. When Esther had to go, she had to go alone. 
You raise a girl. You want her to marry a nice prince. And everything, her destiny is in the hand of the dad and the mom. The friends that God has put around her. Then comes the day of the wedding. And father carries her through. And right at the end, father said, okay, honey. You go now. And break the heart of a man to give his princess to somebody else. Because it's still done by faith. Even though you've raised her, even though her destinies and the things that you've spoken into her life and things like that, ultimately at the end, she takes a walk alone. Here's the cross. And he said, Father, if there is an alternative way, I'll take that. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And God said, this is the only way. And on the cross, in all his life, he said, I don't say anything unless I hear my father say it. I don't do anything unless I see my father do it. The work that I do is my father in me doing the work. I come from him and I'm going back to him. It's of him and through him and to him are all things. But when he came to the cross, he said, why have you forsaken me? He went to the cross on his own. Because ultimately, you have to encounter God on your own. He said to his, uh, to his uh, family, can you go ahead? So he sent them four and stayed behind in the brook Jabbok. And in the middle of the night, wrestled God, just him and God. And God said, what's your name? He said, my name is Jacob. Why did God ask? Did God not know Jacob's name? But the last time a father asked him that, he lied. And God said, what's your name? My name is Jacob. And God said, your name shall be Israel. You've encountered men and you've encountered God. Ultimately, your destiny is found alone. Hallelujah. Find the man, find the woman, find the hand that God will give to you. Don't look for a safe place. But ultimately, you're going to walk the last 10 paces on your own. God bless you.